turn to Luke's Gospel and chapter 17. from verse 26, Luke 17. <clears throat> Jesus says, <clears throat> And just as it happened in the days of Noah, so it shall be also in the days of the Son of Man. They were eating, they were drinking, they were marrying, they were being given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. It was the same as happened in the days of Lot. They were eating, they were drinking, they were buying, they were selling, they were planting, they were building. But on the day that Lot went out from Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. It will be just the same on the day that the Son of Man is revealed. On that day, let not the one who is on the house stop and whose goods are in the house go down to take them away. And likewise, let not the one who is in the field turn back. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever seeks to keep his life shall lose it. Whoever loses his life shall preserve it. I tell you on that night there will be two in one bed. One will be taken, the other will be left. There will be two women grinding at the same place. One will be taken and the other will be left. Two men will be in the field, one will be taken and the other will be left. And answering they said to him, Where Lord? And he said to them, Where the body is, there also will the vultures be gathered. I want us to think a little bit about the days of Noah again. We've been looking at it in our Bible study and I want us to think about something in particular, the birds in the account of the flood. If you turn to Genesis in chapter 8, And I'll read from verse 6. It says, It came about at the end of forty days that Noah opened the windows of the ark which he had made. And he sent out a raven, and it flew here and there until the water was dried up from the earth. And he sent out a dove from him to see if the water was abated from the face of the land. But the dove found no resting place for the sole of her foot. So she returned to him, into the ark, for the water was on the surface of all the earth. Mm. And he put out his hand, took her, brought her into the ark to himself. Mm. So he waited yet another seven days, and again he sent out the dove from the ark. The dove came to him toward evening, and behold, in her beak was a freshly picked olive leaf. So Noah knew that the water was abated from the earth. Then he waited yet another seven days, sent out the dove. She did not return to him again. Two kinds of bird sent out of the ark to illustrate something for us regarding the days of Noah. The birds of the air are a picture of various things, but there are unclean birds, carrion birds, and they congregate on dead things. The ravens were such birds, they were unclean birds, they went out from the ark. It was a very practical kind of test. They went out from the ark quite happy to devour dead things. And so the ravens just chomped away quite happily. 
They're happy to find death and they're happy to destroy that which is dead. There's something of a picture of demonic spirits. We, we, we see in the parables, remember, the birds of the air come and snatch away the word mm -hmm. and um, they, they find a nesting place in the, um, in the tree, in the mustard bush. Birds of the air, foul birds, are a picture of the powers of darkness. The spirit of Antichrist at work in the world in the last days. What is the dove then a picture of? <clears throat> well, we don't have to particularly guess, do we? We can read John and chapter 1. John the Baptist announces the Lamb of God, doesn't he? He's the voice crying in the wilderness, preparing the way of the Lord, make his path straight, repent. How do we make the Lord's path straight? Repent. We call people to repent, to turn. And this one, this voice, sees Jesus. Verse 29 of John and chapter 1, the next day he saw Jesus coming to him and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. This is he on behalf of whom I said, after me comes a man who has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me, and I did not recognize him, but in order that he might be manifested to Israel, I came baptizing in water. And John bore witness, saying, I have beheld the Spirit descending as a dove out of heaven, and he remained upon him. And I did not recognize him, but he who sent me to baptize in water said to me, He upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining upon him, this is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. The Holy Spirit comes like a dove. And what's he looking for? He's looking for a lamb, dear friends. The Holy Spirit is looking for a lamb. He's looking for one who will offer himself a sacrifice. What is the Holy Spirit looking for? He's looking for a lamb. And he's looking for an olive branch. He's looking for an olive tree with life on it. The Holy Spirit, dear friends, will come upon those who are offered in sacrifice. The Holy Spirit will come upon those who are in the tree, the olive tree, and who are alive. <coughs> the Holy Spirit will not come on dead things. The ravens will. Mm. The ravens will flutter around on dead things forever and consume them. But the Spirit of God will only come when he sees a sacrificial lamb. He'll only come to an olive branch that has life. You get the picture? <clears throat> Romans chapter 11 tells us about an olive tree, doesn't it? It is, Israel is the root, <clears throat> we're joined in as unnatural branches, we're grafted in to what? An olive tree. The dove is looking for those who are in Christ, in the body of Christ. The dove is looking for a lamb. 
is looking for those who have offered themselves in sacrifice. Does the Holy Spirit come upon unbelievers? No. Turn to John and chapter 14. John chapter 14. Jesus says, verse 16, I'll ask the Father, he'll give you another helper that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive. Who can't receive? The world can't receive the Holy Spirit. Any form of evangelism, any form of alpha course or similar that encourages people who are not saved to receive the Holy Spirit is unbiblical. It is completely unbiblical. The only spirit that they're going to receive, the only bird that's flying around that will land on a dead creature, is what? The raven. A raptor. Now the Holy Spirit will convict an unbeliever of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment, but they cannot receive the Holy Spirit. Let's make that clear. That's not aimed particularly at anything in particular, but it's a simple biblical truth. Do you understand? Yeah. And it's absolutely dangerous to encourage an unbeliever who is still dead in their sins to seek a spirit to come and fill them. Because they're not going to get a dove what are they going to get? They're going to get an unclean bird. The dove is looking for a lamb. The dove is looking for someone who has offered themselves, given themselves to the Lord Jesus Christ. The dove is looking for someone who is in the body of Christ, who is part of the olive tree, mm. the dove will come on such a one. Turn to Hebrews chapter 6. The dove's quite an interesting bird. Not that I know very much about birds, but I heard this and I've checked it out. <coughs> Not that everything you can read on the internet is going to be true, but I've checked it out as far as I possibly can, and, uh, as many ways as possible in biblical things. And um, But a dove is monogamous. A dove will have one partner for life. Isn't that interesting? The dove only wants to be joined to one that is totally committed for life. I don't know if you've ever wondered why there are so many kind of false converts and, and, and that kind of thing and why? Because I have. 
It's difficult, isn't it? You see people and you think that they genuinely wanted to be Christians, but clearly, over the passage of time, it just doesn't happen and they're back in the world. Why? The dove knows, dear friends. The dove will only be joined to one who is committed for life. When we come to the Lord Jesus Christ, dear friends, it's like a... Scripture says it's like a, a covenant marriage relationship. It is till death us do part. When we come to Jesus, we are saying we belong to you, we want to be joined to you all the days of our life till death do us part. And when we come and offer ourselves sacrificially, like he who is the Lamb, when we come and offer ourselves to be joined to him all the days of our life, he knows when we mean it. He knows. And we can be regenerated by the Holy Spirit. And become part of the olive tree. And the Holy Spirit will come and look for such people. But when there's not been a genuine repentance, dear friends, then the birds, the fowls of the air, will come and nest and snatch away anything of God's Word in a person's life. Hebrews and chapter 6, verse 1, Therefore, leaving the elementary teaching about the Christ, let us press on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from... <laughs> what do we need to turn from? Why do we need to turn from dead things? Because... We, the ravens come to dead things, dear friends. We need to get out of dead things. What are dead works? It's anything that I can do outside of God. It's anything I can do by my own <coughs> strength. It's anything I can do outside of Him. And so we turn from those things. There must be repentance from dead works. And I believe the problem that we have today is that the church has not been preaching repentance. We have a lot of people who are coming. They want Jesus. But they've not turned from dead works things and the fowls of the air can still come and nest in the branches you get the picture I think it's, an, it's a really helpful picture because in the heavenly places there are two birds if you like in the days of Noah the fowls of the air the carrion birds, the ravens, the, they are swooping around the earth. And anything that's dead is open to them. And they come and destroy it. And it doesn't matter whether it's claiming to be belonging to Jesus or what. If it's still got death in it, it's open to the ravens. Do you understand Then there's the Spirit of God who is preparing a bride for the Lord Jesus Christ. And what's he looking for? 
He'll come on a lamb. He'll come where there's a sacrifice. He'll come to people who are offering themselves as a living sacrifice who want to glorify Jesus. He'll come when they're joined into the olive tree. He'll come. He'll empower. He'll grant life to those who have been given fully to Him for life. For life. Till death has due part. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. The cross before me. The world behind me. No turning back. Remember Lot's wife. You get it now? The, the, the scriptures, it's all these things joined together. You've got dead birds looking for a dead body. You've got carrying birds looking for a dead body. You've got, remember Lot's wife, don't turn around. Praise God. There's a dove. There's a Holy Spirit, dear friends. And he wants to come upon an olive tree. He wants to come upon a lamb nature and empower for the last days. The spirit of Antichrist is coming wherever there's death and he's destroyed. The spirit of God wants to come and give life and power and refreshing for a witness right through to the return of Jesus. <clears throat> what is the evidence then? What should we expect when the dove comes, when the Holy Spirit comes upon us? We can be born again. We need to be born again. When we have repented, when we have trusted in Jesus and been regenerated, we become part of the olive tree. There's life, but we need power from on high. Mm. Was Jesus conceived by the Holy Spirit? Did he live a perfect life? But did he still need the Holy Spirit to come upon him as a, as a dove? Yes. yes. You get the picture. Yes. It's consistent throughout Scripture. We need the power of the Holy Spirit in these last days. As in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. The spirit of Antichrist is at work in the world. He's got free course wherever there's death. Those who are dead in trespasses and sins. Those who've not repented from dead works. Can, he can come and nest in the branches of churches that are not preaching repentance where there's no turning. We need the Holy Spirit's power in these days. Let's look at one or two scriptures then. 1 Corinthians 12. <clears throat> How do we know? What does he bring? What should we desire and expect in looking for the power of the Holy Spirit? 1 Corinthians 12, verse 27. Now you are Christ's body and individually members of it. God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, administrations, various kinds of tongues. All are not apostles, are they? All are not prophets, are they? All are not teachers, are they? All are not workers of miracles, are they? All do not have gifts of healing, do they? All do not speak with tongues, do they? All do not interpret, do they? 
but earnestly desire the greater gifts. And I'll show you a more excellent way. What does it say? All do not speak in tongues. Here is a charismatic church, the church in Corinth. They see manifestations and gifts of the Spirit. The common understanding among Pentecostal churches, if you're not aware, is that if you receive the baptism, the, pop, the promise of the Holy Spirit, the gift of the Holy Spirit, the empowering of the Holy Spirit, you will speak in tongues. And that is the sign. And that is quite a common doctrine across many Pentecostal and charismatic churches. I don't believe that that is the case. On the basis of this verse, So what? What is the evidence? What is the effect? What should we be looking for and asking for and desiring the Holy Spirit to come upon us? I want to <clears throat> lay before you seven things this morning. Turn to Ephesians chapter 5. If we are filled with the Holy Spirit, empowered with the Holy Spirit, we will know a new depth, a new intimacy, a new power in our worship of the Lord. Ephesians 5 and verse 18. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Speaking to one another, or admonishing one another, in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to God even the Father. When we're filled with the Spirit, the overflowing of the Holy Spirit will come forth in praise, in worship to God. When the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost, there was an outflowing. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth spoke. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. They received the promise of the Holy Spirit. And many of them spoke in tongues. They were magnifying and glorifying God. And they were prophesying. And we see similar things throughout the book of Acts. But it doesn't say that it has to be the gift of tongues. There should be an overflowing. <clears throat> I think I did it one time with a cup of water. If you pour until the thing is overflowing, it will literally overflow. The evidence that God has filled us to overflowing is that there is an upward flow from the heart. And that will be verbal. It may be prophecy, it may be praise, it may be tongues. But it will be verbal. And it will be worship. It will glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew 12 verse 34 says, After the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. If you are filled... The evidence that you are filled is that it will overflow out of the abundance. An overflowing of the heart, the mouth will speak. I think where I would disagree with some 
is that that must be the gift of tongues. I think you can say that it often is the gift of tongues. I think you can say that, that it's predominantly, but you can't say it is solely the gift of tongues from Scripture on the basis of 1 Corinthians 12. So there will be worship. Turn to Luke chapter 1. Let's see someone filled with the Holy Spirit. Luke chapter 1, verse 67. Zacharias was filled with the Holy Spirit, and what did he do? Speak in tongues? He prophesied. You see? And he blessed the Lord. He worshipped. He exalted God. And he prophesied. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. If we are filled with the Holy Spirit, dear friends, we will worship Him. Out of the abundance of our heart, our mouth will speak. There will be an overflowing of worship. When He fills us with living water, there's a, a spring which springs up to eternal life. There's worship. Do you want to worship him? Then tell him, dear friends. Lord, in these last days I want you to fill me with your spirit because I want to worship you like I've never worshipped you before. And I know that when you pour out your spirit, when the, the dove comes down upon me, out of my heart will flow praise, adoration, and worship. Number two. Turn to Acts chapter 7. Someone else who's filled with the Holy Spirit, what does it bring? A man called Stephen. <clears throat> he came to Jesus and he got prosperity and happiness. <laughs> Now he got stoned, yes. Literally. And this is what it says. Acts chapter 7, verse 55. But being what? Full of the Holy Spirit, what did he do? He gazed intently into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. Do you want to see heavenly things? Do you want to see more and more of Jesus as he is? Yes. Revealed as the glorified and risen Son of God. Then tell him, Lord, I want you to fill me with the Holy Spirit because I want my eyes to be lifted to heaven. I want to see Jesus at the right hand of the Father in all his glory. Because when we're filled with the Holy Spirit, dear friends, it gives us a greater understanding of the glory of Jesus. Tell him, dear friends. Make it your prayer. Number three. Luke chapter one. Somebody else filled with the Holy Spirit. Luke chapter 1, John the Baptist was filled with the Holy Spirit in his mother's womb. Quite unique. Verse 41. It came about when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. When we're filled with the Holy Spirit, dear friends, we become aware of the presence of God like never before.
come to a greater understanding of the fellowship of the Holy Spirit when we're filled with Him. Amen? Amen. Make it your prayer. Lord, I want to know more of the presence of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Please fill me. Number four. Turn to Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13. And verse 6. When they'd gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they found a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet, whose name was Bar Jesus. A false prophet. In the last days there will be many false prophets, false teachers. He was proconsul. He was with the proconsul, Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence. This man summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elymas, the magician, for thus his name is translated, was opposing them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. What do false prophets do? Turn people away, dear friends, from the true faith. But Saul, who was also known as Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, fixed his gaze upon him and said, You are full of all deceit and fraud. You son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease to make crooked the straight ways of the Lord? And he prophesies of him. When we're filled with the Holy Spirit, dear friends, we become spiritually discerning like nothing else. Any Pentecostal church or charismatic church or so-called alive church, dear friends, who can't see through the blatantly obvious false prophets and false teachers that are parading through the body of Christ in these days, they are deluded. They are not filled with the Holy Spirit, they are filled with another spirit. They've got a big dose of ravens, not the dove from heaven. And we're seeing in these days many false prophets and false teachers being unmasked. And the evidence of their harlotry being paraded throughout the world. T.B. Joshua and all the abominations that were surrounding that man. A false prophet. An obvious false prophet. And yet Many so-called spirit-filled Christians couldn't see that was a charlatan. Bethel Church. Obvious false teachers and false prophets. And many so-called spirit-filled Christians will sing Bethel songs and Bethel worship and Bethel music and they can't see it. It's a sham, dear friends. It's just ravens making nests. Those who are genuinely filled with the Holy Spirit, dear friends, will spot false prophets and false teachers. Because he is the Spirit of Truth. Make your prayer, Lord, fill me with the Holy Spirit because I want to be able to discern the false teachers and false prophets in these last days. Turn to Acts chapter 2. Being filled with the Holy Spirit. Verse 14. 
43, everyone kept feeling a sense of awe. Many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles and all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. They began selling their property and possessions were sharing with them with all, as many as might have need. And day by day continuing with one mind in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God, having favour with all the people, and the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. What do we see? They were continuing, devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. It was an outworking, it was an evidence that they were filled with the Holy Spirit. They had a love of the truth. They had a desire for the Word of God. When we're filled with the Holy Spirit, dear friends, we'll have a passion for the Word of God. Lord, I want to have a passion for the Word of God. Fill me with your Spirit. They were breaking bread together. They were remembering the Lord, eating and drinking together and remembering the Lord, and it was precious. Lord, I want to come, proclaim your death. I want to eat and drink in remembrance of you, and I want it to be precious. So fill me with your Holy Spirit. They were gathering together to pray. Lord, I want a perseverance in prayer. So fill me with the Holy Spirit. I don't want to be struggling to get up and pray in the morning. I don't want to be struggling to come together with the brethren to pray. So fill me with the Holy Spirit. Because when they were filled with the Holy Spirit, they met together to pray. And there was a depth of fellowship and sharing among them, dear friends, when they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Do you want that? Well, ask Him. Number six. Turn to Acts chapter four. <clears throat> Acts chapter 4, verse 8, Peter, what? Filled with the Holy Spirit. Here's a man filled with the Holy Spirit. How do we know? He said, rulers and elders of the people, if we're on trial today for the benefit done to a sick man as to how this man has been made well, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by this name this man stands here before you in good health. He's the stone which was rejected by you, the builders, but became the very cornerstone. There is salvation in no one else. There's no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. A man filled with the Holy Spirit. And what's his heart's desire, dear friends? <laughs> that it be known to all. That in Jesus alone is salvation. There's no other name given among men by which we must be saved. Dear friends, when we're filled with the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God within us will stir us to go into all the world and preach the Gospel. To be a witness to all men. There'll be a passion and a desire by the Spirit of God in our hearts that all must be reached. Because all must be saved. Because all must <coughs> repent and trust in the Saviour. That God has desired that all men come to a knowledge of the truth. Mm. Do you have that? 
When you're filled with the Holy Spirit, that's what He does, dear friends. And if you don't want Him to do that, He won't come and fill you. You will receive power from on high when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. There's a dove, dear friends. The Holy Spirit wants to come. But He's looking for a sacrificial people. He's looking for people with life who are in the body. And He's looking for people who are crying out to Him. Fill me. That I might go into all the world. And preach the gospel. One more. Acts chapter 4. <coughs> And verse 31. When they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness, with, with a freedom, with an openness. You couldn't shut them up. Because they were filled with the Holy Spirit, dear friends. When we're filled with the Holy Spirit. No raven, no vulture, no nothing will ever be able to shut us up. We will speak boldly and we will speak freely until death passes from this world. Two spirits at work. Two birds as illustration. We need the dove. We need the Holy Spirit. Can you ask him this morning, Lord, fill me because I want to worship like I've never worshipped before. Can you ask him this morning, Fill me, because I want to see more of Jesus. I want to see him in all his glory at the right hand of the Father. And I need that revelation of heaven, because persecution is coming. Can you say this morning, fill me, because I want to know a depth of fellowship, of the Holy Spirit that I've not known until this day. Because in your presence is fullness of joy. And I can be a miserable, grumpy son without it. Can you say this morning, Lord, fill me with the Holy Spirit because I want to be a discerning saint in these days. I can see there's people being taken in with all kinds of garbage all the time, all, all around me. Lord, I want to see. I want my eyes open. I want to be able to discern wrong spirits and wrong teachers and wrong prophets and wrong false apostles. And that's what the Holy Spirit will do. Can you say this morning, I want you to fill me because I want to build up the body of Christ. I want to meet with other believers. I, I want that breaking of bread to be precious and, 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 and so revealing the cross. I, I want our prayer meetings to be centered around Jesus and filled with the Holy Spirit. I, I want a love of the truth. I want a love for the Word of God like I've never had before in my Christian life. So fill me. you say, Lord, fill me with the Holy Spirit, because I want everyone to know the Savior. And I need a freedom to preach. I need an enabling by the Holy Spirit to make Jesus known, to call men and women to repent and turn from dead works and turn to our blessed Savior. Can you say that this morning?
can I just urge you, go away and say it to him. And keep on asking and keep on seeking and keep on knocking until he meets with you in a very, very special way. Because be sure of this, there's a lot of ravens out there. There's a lot of death out there. And the devil's having a field day. And the dove is looking for a lamb. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for, for the illustration in the story of Noah about the birds. Lord, if I've not made it clear, if it's just not, Lord, forgive me. Be our teacher in these days because we know we need the Holy Spirit. We need to be filled. So give us a heart and a passion and a desire to seek you, to call upon you. Lord, that you meet with us in a wonderful